Okay, my friends, please be seated. We have this morning a very challenging uh, lecture, a contribution to where we are in our world of art and culture by our dear friend of the house, uh, Paul Wonders. He has been before with us and then he explained a new kind of guild system, so how you can become a master in your art form. And I remember Tales Great Surprise, already since 1981. We work like that as Christian artists. So we are the fulfilling of his prophecy or vice versa, just how you want to see this. So, um, um, I heard him speaking at the conference uh, quite some time ago, and there he presented some new things, and I thought this will be very interesting for us as artists to hear that, because it has all to do with your life, where you are now, and where you are going to be in the future. So, if you like to have predictions about the future, we all like to know our future. How long will you live? What will happen? You know. Will you be happy? And um, whatever. Well, Paul's the man to talk to. <laughs> yeah. But by the way, um, hopefully you have seen that outside the exposition is ready. And we are very thankful for Miriam Hoffman and Teddy Leo and Olivier from the office, CA office. They've done a uh, wonderful work. So please take some time really to see it. It's some very interesting work. And you all have seen the work of uh, the girl from Denmark yesterday and all that stuff. It's very funny. My goodness. What a creative mind to, to think about that. Still my compliments. Touching. Paul, you have the floor and uh, shock us. <laughs> Okay, is it okay when I stand up here? It's a little bit from above, huh? but okay. But then you can, it's, it's because of the flip chart, so you can see well. Um, thank you for being here, Lane, after his blended arm. <laughs> um, not everybody knows me. I was here, I think, three years ago yeah. in, in Germany. So, short introduction Paul Donders, uh, married to Sylvia. Uh, 40 years now, and we plan for the next 40 years. Uh, we just had our 40th celebration with our kids and their wives and friends uh, in France, and we enjoyed it very much. And so we said, my wife said, let's talk about our marriage to the kids. Uh, and then we'll ask, let them ask questions. And I said, are you really sure you want to have questions? <laughs> She says, yes, yes, that's really funny. Um, <laughs> so we, we talked about three quarters of an hour, and then they had one and a half hour questions. <laughs> but it was really fun. Um, we think it's a privilege to be a family. Um, we were born in Holland, but I studied architecture in uh, Germany. So I'm an architect from profession, worked as an architect for eight years. Uh, I love to do that, but I always knew this is not my final calling. So I was in a process of learning a uh, craft and still knowing in that craft this is not my final thing. And I enjoyed it very much and I learned a lot. And everything I do today is also rooted in my studies at that time and my work. So. 31 years ago, we started a, a company, Expand, which is a training consultancy, coaching company. Uh, we are still there. Uh, we started as three friends, and we are still friends, which is uh, also not so bad. Um, we are about 100 people in 12 countries. Uh, I'm personally back in Holland since 20 years. I'm very much, I like Holland, so if I talk too positive about Holland, uh, you just think, well, he has no clue. <laughs> um, but I was 22 years outside of Holland, all over the world working, and then if you work outside, you see from the outside also the beauty that is there. 
And if you're inside, you only see what is not yet working. <laughs> not yet. And so, but I love, I love actually countries and cultures. Five times a year I work in South Africa. Uh, my wife and I decided when we turned 55 uh, that we really want to have any kind of contribution to Africa. So we did an investigation and we found out uh, that we could and we learned. And so I'm there five times a year. We have a little house there and it's like my second home. Uh, it is a, a different world, Africa, uh, but also a beautiful world. I learn every time when I go there. So in three weeks I go again, uh, I'm already looking forward to learn from these uh, fantastic people. So I'm a, I'm a very happy man that I can learn. Uh, that's also what we like to do, learning. The topic of today, or oh, before the topic, I'll introduce Schors. Schors is there, that's Schors. Uh, Schors is a good friend of my oldest son and his father is my best friend. Uh, we wrote the book Mastery together. He's a, uh, an artist in gold jewelry and goldsmith. Shaw studied three different masters and, uh, and he just wrote his first book. And my son is writing and they have like a little uh, international writer's guild. Uh, very funny, not funny, uh, positive funny. Yeah. <laughs> If you want to ask him, uh, just ask him. He has a little card, you make a photo, you have his book on your phone. Uh, that is the question of copyrights, <laughs> which is also a very interesting question today. Okay, so the topic is uh, the lifelong artist in a VUCA world. This topic is, a, is for you. So it's, it's not so much how we want to change the world, it's more it's for you. So today, this morning, you are the heroes. Uh, just take what you can get, listen. Um, I strongly believe that God loves us as we are and that he has a huge trust in you and a huge respect for you. So um, if he looks at you, he is excited. Uh, so please just try to listen to hear what is important for me um, and I just see myself as a possibility to serve you where you are. So I'm going to talk about the 100 year life, um, the VUCA world, new competences to train and next steps. VUCA, yeah VUCA, uh, I'll explain that a little, <laughs> a little later. <laughs> Uh, new competences to train. There are actually five competences today which are important uh, to live a healthy, productive, creative way. Um, and those five competences, they are designed and, and they, we are agreeing on that more international. And we're going to talk about that to give a little idea what can help you and also for yourself to ask the question, which of those do I need to develop? Because you cannot develop five competences. Uh, you can do that in five years, but developing a competence takes time. So I give a, a nice overview and then you can choose for yourself what is important for me. Um, there are numbers here and we will make photos of this, so you don't have to make notes. There is a little workbook uh, with some notes in it, if you can make notes. Uh, so feel free how to do it. Let's start. Um, the 100 year life. So in 2018, today, we have about in the Western uh, economy, about 1% of population is about 100 years old or older. It's about one percentage, so uh, it's not a big group. In 2050, that is like 32 years now, yeah. Uh, the average life expectation in Holland, uh, sorry for the rest of the world, but for Holland it's like that, <laughs> it's 100. This is the average life expectation. That means that people who die before with, with a car accident or at 50 or 60, they are all in the average. Um, and it goes a little bit further. What happened is, if you see 1850 to 2001, 100. Uh, 1815 in Western Europe, the average life expectation was 45 years old. Then in 2000, it's 85 years old. 
This is including uh, World War I and World War II, when millions died, right? Millions. Um, every 10 years, there is a plus of two years in life expectancy. And that was the reality behind us. Now, obviously, what is behind us doesn't say a lot about what is in front of us. But there is some realistic expectation that this will continue um, not so strong, but it will end somewhere around the 105. Realistically, medically, from a medical uh, point of view, we are designed to become 120 years old. That is, the, that is our heart. I was uh, looking into our open heart surgery. Uh, we work in hospitals and I like surgery. I like to look into that. So I went for a whole day and looked into two <laughs> open heart surgeries. It's fantastic. You can stand there and look into it and then they open it and then you see the heart. And this was, the first one was a lady who was 85 years old and the heart was still okay. So, and then they work on the heart and do that, and uh, so then they close it again, and the next one. Um, it's fantastic how our body is designed to actually recover. Uh, we are designed to recover ourselves. Uh, so, basically, we are designed our, to live about 120 years. Obviously, we don't make that uh, because we do a lot of other stuff that doesn't help. Um, but reality is that the average life expectation will go up still. Uh, just a few um, little thoughts about that. There are many reasons. It's, uh, there is actually a book on that, The 100 Year Life, came out last year. Uh, Linda Gretton, Andrew Scott, she's a psychologist, she's an economist, two professors uh, in London on the university, and uh, they wrote a book on what is happening and what can happen. We don't know what will happen, what can happen, and what are the consequences? Financially, relational, uh, economical, political. Uh, that's why we today talk about um, how will your company cope with the 100 year life. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of articles on this. Uh, one of the new things will also be cross-generational work. So how can we work with different generations at one time? So what happens is infant mortality went down dramatically over the last 100 years. Uh, epidemics went down dramatically. Penicillin, that was only invented in 1945. That's not so long ago. Then healthcare went up, nutrition went up, medical technically technology went up, hygiene and sanitation went up dramatically, financial wellness all over the world went up, and even poverty. Uh, the new numbers on poverty, 1995, you had 1.7 billion people who would live under the real poverty level. That was 30% of world population. Today, in 2017, it's 1.7 billion, and that is about 10%, which still is a lot. I mean, because everybody who lives under poverty level is too much. But it's a huge difference, and that has an impact on life expectation. So there is a, a lot. these are just a few of those numbers. So those guys are not crazy. They, they did some investigation. And what happened is... Um, 50% of all people in the Western world will reach the age of. And I thought, well, I was born in 1957, so I want to know <laughs> what is my expectation. <laughs> so that's why I start with 1957. But Lane, there is a number for you too. Huh? So <laughs> yes, there's a lot of hope for you. <laughs> so the, uh, remember again the average life expectation, not how old you can become, but the average. All the people in 1957, this is, uh, this is Western Europe, but also US and Japan, the, a little bit the Western world, um, and that is, the average is 93. Uh, so 77, it's 97, and then 97 is 101, and then 217 is 105. The average life expectancy. So, 
That means we need to think new about life. Uh, if you plan to die about 85 years old, <laughs> and then you think, well, I work till 65, then I have 20 years where I can take my caravan and drive to Europe. You know? um, that is a wrong perspective. It's a wrong perspective. Also, the question is, how will be your last years? Will that be 20 years of suffering? No, it will be three years of suffering. Average, three. That means if you become 105, uh, you're till 102, you're fit. <laughs> Insurance companies think a lot about this because you know the last three years are expensive and, and they have to calculate that well. Uh, but also, who is going to pay your pension? <laughs> you. <laughs> Well, in Holland, we have the best pension funds of the world, but even those will not work uh, for this. And not even it's about pension. I, I'm a fan of Marc Chagall. I, yesterday, I talked to an artist. <laughs> He's 40 years old, and he didn't know who is Marc Chagall. Can you imagine? I was shocked. Uh, he's a real artist. But anyway, if you don't know Marc Chagall, it doesn't matter. Marc Chagall <laughs> was a painter. <laughs> He was a Jewish painter, he was a fantastic artist. Um, he was born uh, late 1800s uh, in Russia. Uh, he was married to a beautiful wife. He was persecuted in Russia. He uh, studied in Paris, then he, he couldn't go back to Russia. Went back, but had to go to Paris. Uh, had a terrible life of uh, not easy. Uh, then he became famous, then the Germans came in into France, and then he had to flee again from France to New York. Then he came to New York, then uh, his, he was very famous at that time already, as an artist. And then his wife died because of a medical uh, failure in hospital, and he broke down. But he had a daughter, he t she took care of him, uh, and then he married again to a really nice Russian other lady. Uh, who was really nice, uh, got two more children with him and uh, ripped him off and went away with a boyfriend. So then he was broke again. <laughs> now he was about 60, right? <laughs> then uh, he was really down, his daughter was still there, helped him, so he moved to France uh, and then he got married again and this wife was really nice and stick to him until he was 95 years old. He worked till he was 94. You maybe you know the, the beautiful stained glasses in the, uh, the cathedral in Mainz, or Mainz? Yeah, it's Mainz, I think. Eh? Mainz. Beautiful uh, bl blue. I was there. It's fantastic. He did that between 93 and 94. That was he when he designed it at his age. So it's not about how we can reach the age of pension and then cruise to relax till we die. Uh, it's much more how can we be creative all our life. But that means we need to find a new way of thinking about the marathon we will walk. We are not doing sprints. Uh, we have to consider marathons. And that's a different thing. So at the same time, um, we live in a world, what we explain as the VUCA world. Um, and VUCA stands for Volatility, Uncertainty, Complexity and Ambiguity. If you Google that, you'll find many articles on that. Um, the, 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 ver the word VUCA comes from the military training of commandos. You know, commandos, those guys who go in sneaky uh, with a small group and then do something and go back. Uh, this is a highly intensive training. And in, in two-thirds of the training of a commando team, they come into a VUCA room. And they call it the VUCA room. That is a room like this, higher, it's a, it's a big old hall. And they will hang the, the, the commando with a rope on his foot and hang him on the foot on the ceiling. So he hangs like five meters below the ground on his foot with all his gear on. And then they, they blind him and put ear dops in. And then they create this hole as a VUCA hole with snakes and stuff and poison and danger and crazy music. And then if the VUCA room is ready, then they take away his blindfold, his ear dops, and then he hangs there and then he has to survive. 
That's his training. That's a VUCA training. Because they say they have to learn to uh, work with a war zone. So actually they create in that room a war zone where everything is highly unpredictable, unpredictable risks, where everything is uncertain, where everything is very complex, everything happens at the same time, and what you see is maybe not what it is. So there comes the, world, the word VUCA. So we describe actually our world, our society, as a war zone, which is interesting. Um, this is not only dramatic, this is not negative, this is just reality. Volatility means we live in a world with many volatile projects. I will tell a little bit about that. We live in a very uncertain world. We don't know what will happen in the next five years. A very complex world where we cannot understand the whole picture anymore. And we live with fake news and we are all in our own bubble. And it's very difficult to discern what is the truth. So this world needs leadership. And the leadership we describe also as a VUCA leadership. You as an artist, you are a leader, if you like it or not. <laughs> because you lead by influence. A fantastic book I was reading last year is Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Uh, he is a... Sir Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, he was the, the main rabbi of the whole English country's uh, Jewish community. And he retired two years ago and he writes 25 books. He's a philosopher also. Uh, he is very in favor of Christianity, but he is a real uh, rabbi Jewish person. And he wrote a book, Lessons in Leadership, 52 lessons of 52 people of the first five books of Moses. Uh, well, there are only five books, <laughs> the five books of Moses. And so for every week there is a reading. It's about Cain, it's about uh, Abraham or Noah and so on. Um, and he would say, uh, in one of his readings, he says, there are two kinds of power. Uh, there is power by might and power, and there is power by influence. And he says, the prophet has the power of influence. When the prophet dies, his influence will go on, even become bigger. When the king dies, the power is gone. Uh, and you are in the business of leadership in influence. That makes you responsible. <laughs> you can still decide to go away. Because <laughs> if you don't know it, you're not responsible. But... Um, you, as an artist, are in the leadership of influence. You influence. And if you give influence, uh, that is because God called you to influence and to give pictures, to give ideas, to translate uh, God's word, to translate prophecy, to translate philosophy. And in that, you will lead. So let me give you a few ideas of what we need kind of leaders in this world where we live in today. We need leaders who give vision. Because if everything is unpredictable in the world, we have no clue what will happen and there is a lot of risk, we need people who have the courage to design a vision, this is what I believe we should go to. Even if I have no clue what will happen. So we need people who develop courage to be themselves, to embrace their calling, and to stand up and to give perspective. Obviously not for the whole world, but for what God has shown you to do. We need leaders in an area of uncertainty who are able to understand. Because people around you will feel uncertain. More and more. And then you can say, well, you're stupid. I mean, even you're a Christian. How can you be uncertain? God is on your side. Hey, maybe you have not enough faith. Um, that is not a very godly way <laughs> of leading. Uh, we need leaders who have the courage to give a vision, but the understanding to stand beside people and to say, can I serve you? And I want to understand you. I'm not preaching you to change you and to make you what I want you to be, but I want to understand who you are and I want to resonate. We need leaders like that. 
in the complexity world, where everything is not understandable anymore because it's too complex, we need leaders who are willing to give clarity. Because there is so much complexity, we cannot overview that. In the big heap of complexity, we need to find a place where we say, okay, we don't know the rest, but this is what we know. Let's give some clarity that we work here and make something really happen. And believe that the rest will in one way or the other, and we believe God will be in control also, work. But we take the responsibility for a part. And then in ambiguity, when everything is, when we don't know what is the truth anymore, then we need people, leaders who are agile, who are willing to learn and to unlearn and to relearn and to think and to act in all what is happening. So let's look a little bit into this, what does this world look like? So the volatile world. There are about 30 plus volatile projects. A volatile project is a negative influence on more than one billion people. So we would call something a volatile project when it has a negative impact on more than a billion people. There are about 30 plus, about 40, 45 at this moment recognized volatile projects working at the same time in our world. This is not new. Uh, we had the same situation in World War II. There was a huge amount of things happening, uh, un unoverviewable, uh, that was really on different levels influencing billions and billions of people. Uh, we had the same in 500 after Christ. As all the people in Europe were moving and changing and nobody was knowing what is happening. But we have it now in a different way. Just to give a few ideas of the, of the 30 plus. Water is one of the big volatile projects. Too less water in too many countries, no fresh water. Uh, there are wars about water in India. Uh, and it's not solved yet. We are working on it. Cyber criminality, we all know, that is one of the big things. We call it the hacker attack. We have it not in our hands. China, big brother scale. Uh, I think you're aware of the China situation that from January this year, they have the social scale. You start with 1,000 points and everybody, 1.3 billion Chinese are organized and they buy everything with their phone and they are registered. And you start with 1,000 social points and every time you do something wrong, you lose points. And that is like the total Big Brother watching system existing. And if you look at Chinese people, I talk to so many, I, I look at programs, and they would mainly say, fantastic, it's so good. We have no criminality anymore in two years, because we know everything about everybody. We in Europe think about the, the law against privacy. <laughs> I mean, that's funny. <laughs> the Chinese think this is the most crazy thing you can do because we know everything and we want to know everything and we think it's justice. If you walk over the, uh, the street and you walk by red, then there's a big sh board that shows that you walk by, walk by red and you lose points. If you do that five times, you lose a lot of points and your face will be on all the billboards of the town. If you are looking for a lady to marry, then you first go into the system because this is transparency, right? We love transparency. So uh, you go into the system, you tick in Ching Wu Wa, and, uh, and you see exactly who he is and what kind of a points he has and why he lost his points. One of the reasons if, if you lose points is if you do not visit your, uh, your, uh, your uh, parents-in-law, can you say that? Yeah, you have to visit your parents in law every two months. And, and if you don't do that, you lose points. Uh, much more if you don't visit your parents, obviously. So, and it's all tracked because you're always everywhere trackable. So, and they love it. So we say, whoa, whoa, not in Europe. <laughs> well, have you ever seen a Chinese uh, phone? all the Chinese phones are connected directly to China government. So you're in the system also if you have a Chinese phone. If you buy by Alibaba, you know Alibaba? 
yeah, they are owned for 70% by the state of China. So everything you buy by Alibaba, it makes you a friend of China. <laughs> Isn't that nice? They know everything. They love you. So, um, <laughs> but this is a volatile project. Because we're talking about a system with no democracy deciding on everything in life. Destruction of women. Um, we don't talk so much about it anymore, but it is all over the place. Millions and millions of women are killed, are raped, are misformed, are misjudged. It's, it's a real big thing. One of the little things in that is that in Asia at the moment, 100 million men don't want to marry anymore. 100 million men, well, I would say if they don't want to marry, then they better don't marry. <laughs> so they all have a virtual wife. So they have a virtual wife and they love it. Because the wife is always nice, she's communicating with you, she helps you in everything you need, she gives you nice feedback. Uh, and if you don't like her anymore, you stop her and you get a new one. But this is 100 million, at, that was last year, probably now more, registered men who have a virtual wife. Uh, that actually is the destruction of women. So, you have Islamic terrorism, um, that is a reality which is still there and inflecting uh, economies and people and democracies. We have the climate change. Well, that's a minor one. <laughs> but we are talking mainly about climate change, and actually climate change is just one of the 44 projects. But we are focused on that because we think this is really important, and we can do something about it. Let me tell you, yes, we should do something about it, but it's just one of 45. National debts. The USA has now 14 trillion dollar debts, and in eight years they will have 24 trillion de dollar debts. Every year at this moment, even with Mr. Uh, Trump, um, but Obama did it already, now Trump is doing it again, 800, uh, 800, billion, 800 billion debts, state debt. 800 billion, that's a lot of money, right? Um, so, here are a few, and we have about a little bit more than 40 in, in the end. What shall we say? Shall we do something about it? Most of those things, you cannot do a lot about it. Most of the things we here in the room have very, very little influence on. So the reality is we have to learn that our world is not anymore in control. That can make you fearful, or it can give you courage and faith. And the big word, you, will, you, you notice the newspapers, you look in readings and publications, there is one word that will come more and more, it's the word courage. Courage is one of the big things. Are you willing to take the courage to be who you are, to stand where you are, and to go in a direction you believe in? We need leaders who are courageous and servants at the same time. Ever heard about servant leadership? That was the, the guru thing of the 90s. And we still talk about it, and it's important because Christ says you should be a servant leader. But Christ also said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all the nations, <laughs> tell them all I said to you. He said also, be courageous. So we, today we talk about courageous servanthood leadership. Courage is a big thing. So let's look at the uncertainty. Um, the Uncertain World, uh, a very nice book on this, the fourth revolution, industrial revolution, Klaus Schwab. Uh, you know about the World Economic Forum, Davos, ever heard about that? Where, where people come together once a year. Um, they uh, have World Economic Forums all over the world, and Klaus Schwab is the founder and CEO of that. This is his newest book on the new way of work and the new way of where are we. He talks about 25 different trends in economy, social and technical things that can happen. And then they investigated how much percentage do we know it will happen. And that can be 50% or 60 or 30%. And what are the, the profits of this trend and what is the negative of this trend? Excellent book on that. 
Um, so there is a list, the 100 list disappearing professions. In Oxford, they made that list every year. Which professions will disappear? Many will disappear within short time. Um, there is informal employment that brings also an uncertainty. Um, was it a publication uh, two weeks ago? The biggest challenge for the future of work hasn't changed for decades, and we call that informal employment. People who have work but who are not on the payroll. In Holland, we call that ZZP, <laughs> uh, but it is people without a contract. So if you look at the numbers today in this world, which is so prosperous and little poverty, still in Southeast Asia, 60% of all people are not employed, but have work. They are self-employed. They work on the streets, they buy little things, they have little shops. In India, it's 80%. India, this will be one of the biggest economies in the next 10 years, but 80% is informal employed. So you have 100 really, really, really rich people in India, then you have 100 million, they have 200 million rich people, but then you have a lot of people who are just surviving. Africa is 70% informal employment, South America 50%, Europe is 15%, still. <laughs> that will change. Um, because in 2035, 50% of all jobs will be robotized. And that is the conservative estimation. Uh, obviously, there will be new jobs, but a lot of jobs will be robotized. 2030, uh, the numbers is that about in Europe, 50% in Europe will be self-employed. So the same informal employment will be in Europe, about 50%. This is only 12 years from now. It's not so far. Um, there was a nice investigation in Norway about the capability of entrepreneurship. So how many people have the, the genetic gifts of being an entrepreneur? So we talked about it, and uh, Schorz's father, Chris Sommer, he is a, a, a very well-known artist in, in Goldsmith, and he's a very good entrepreneur. Uh, why? What made him so successful? Maybe also because he comes from a whole family of entrepreneurs. So actually they found out that the maximum of 5% of population in the Western world has the gift of entrepreneurship. So what is with the 45% other people who are self-employed, who have not the gift of entrepreneurship? We need to learn something. So there is a challenge. That makes us uncertain. How do we do that? 20 th uh, 25, 40% um, of the Fortune 500, so you always have this typical American list of the top 500 companies of the world. In 2025, th compared to today, what is today on the list of 500, 40% will not be on that list anymore. 40% of the top 500 in the next seven years will disappear from the list. 40%. Those are millions of people working there. They will not be destroyed, but they will go smaller and smaller and have no clue what to do about it. So that brings uncertainty. Can you imagine? Just realistic uncertainty. How will we do it? So, another one is um, in the next decades, the average lifespan of a profession will be 15 years. So if you learn today as an engineer, then 15 years you have time to work like that because after that your job, or not your job, your profession is not existing anymore. If you want to study law, be careful. In 2030, only 10% of the people who studied law till today will have work anymore. Only 10%. 90% have to do something else. Because artificial intelligence does that much faster and better. So, 
this brings some uncertainty in the world where we live. This brings some unpredictable risk. Let's look at the bright side, the complex world. Um, a moonshot project. This is you can easily remember that a moonshot product comes. The word comes from Google. Um, they would say a moonshot pro project is we shoot something to the moon. Um, that is in phase four or five of the development. So if five is it's on the market, phase four is just before the market. Uh, it is ten times better as the competition. So this product is not ten percent. It's ten times better as the competition and is bought by more than one billion people. Remember here we had a billion people with bad faces, here we have a billion people with happy faces <laughs> in the beginning. Um, so this is a product, a moonshot product, that will be bought by more than one billion people. It will be ten times better as the rest, and it is just before release. Uh, the numbers here are from last year, so it is already old, it's 2017. I give an example. Uh, one of their moonshot projects uh, products is free Wi-Fi all over the world on any place, in full access. That's a moonshot project, uh, and they have three projects to to realize that. One is with the balloons. Maybe you heard about that. They do it already in Africa. They put the balloons in the stratosphere and they make a network of balloons so that everywhere where you are in that area, you get free Wi-Fi. You don't pay for it. You get it free, and you get it everywhere and day and night. It's not depending on whatever uh, electricity or what. As long as your telephone has a battery. <laughs> so, how many moonshot projects you think at this moment Google has? So, in the making. And are already on, on step four. I must be honest, Google has 50,000 people working for them, 30,000 people are working in the research center, 30,000. Uh, Google makes profit every year, but they never ever paid out a dividend to their shareholders. Did you know that? You don't get a dividend, never. You can sell it for more money, but you never get a dividend, because all the profit goes into the research center. So. There they produce these things. Well, Google has at this moment 100 of these projects. So 100 products that will come in the next three years and will change th the way of life for more than a billion people. Then, <laughs> A2UA, <laughs> no, <it's> Apple, <laughs> uh, Tesla, Uber, uh, Amazon, they together have also 100. Oh, Facebook was also here, sorry. <laughs> Fatua. <laughs> uh, China, we have not clue yet, but Alibaba and some of those guys have, have shown some stuff. They have about 50. So, in the next three years, uh, conservatively thinking, there will be 250 new products which are 10 times better as the comparing product and having impact on more than a billion people. That is complex. We, we, have, we cannot handle that anymore, right? Don't try. <laughs> I don't do. So, what happens is, we are in the fourth industrial revolution um, where things are now in a, in a, in a massive way developing. Also good things, many good things. So the half-time worldwide applicable knowledge. So that is, in so much time, the worldwide knowledge, which you can use, applicable, not just books, the applicable knowledge will double, was in 1900, 100 years. So from 1800 to 1900, the worldwide applicable knowledge doubled. In 1950, um, it was in 50 years. And in 2018, it is every four years. So every four, yeah. Uh, that, that's not easy in a complex thing, but they would say it's not just the gathering of information, it is knowledge that you can use to produce or to make something. Yeah. But that's also research, which is not always defined what can you make with it. It's also basic research. 2018, in the IT world, it's 1.5 years. So every 1.5 years, the applicable knowledge doubles. 
What do you think in the medical world it is now? So the medical world, how, how often is that worldwide doubling? Give any idea? <laughs> yeah, it is half a year. Yeah. 0 0.5. Um, this is very understandable because all these people like Google and Gore and Apple, they are all interested to live long and they put a lot of money in uh, medical uh, research. Uh, and everybody is involved in that. The medical world is the biggest economical factor of the world at the moment. Um, but that means we are in a complex world. It is not easy to say what will happen in the next five years. Well, maybe we, we shouldn't say that. <laughs> but it forces us to live today to make decisions. What are we doing? What is my calling? How do I handle that? Where do I grow? What is my profession? So young people, how should they decide what to study? That's a new competence you need to develop. So the last one of the VUCA is the ambiguity world. Well, we all know about fake news, but let's be honest, you live in a bubble. Each one of us lives in a bubble. Uh, we think we, we know a lot, <laughs> but we know a little package from our bubble, and we must acknowledge that. If we do not acknowledge that, we think we know it, and we just don't know it. But that makes it difficult. Um, you have what we will call the left and the right paranoia. So uh, the, m the most people would say there is right paranoia, all these right-left people, populists, they are all paranoia, but the left side is as paranoia as well. Uh, but it is the right ones say the left are crazy and the left say the right are crazy, but re let's realistic, we are all crazy. Yeah. We have no clue. Um, we have USA, Russia, China closing the info borders. Uh, that is a real big thing. Like China, you cannot get information into the internet in China. You just cannot, they close the borders. IKEA works in, in, in China. Uh, they have about 300 shops in China, 300 shops. IKEA, fantastic company. They have to pay $100 million every year just for the access into the internet. And you cannot get in anymore. Russia is the next who will close. The states are busy to close. So we are in a system where we are closing the internet. We're not opening it. Um, a big thing is we have a growing illiteracy worldwide in the first, second and third world. Makes 80% of the total world population highly manipulable. Because 80% of the world can read but cannot think anymore. Oh, this is difficult. Uh, let's scrap that. 100% um, <laughs> of the world can think. But 80% is losing its illiteracy to be able to think and reflect. And that makes that big group very manipulable. You can tell them anything. Look at Brexit, how it happened. And when this was 80% of England, they were just never heard about EU. Well, that's a little bit over the edge, but um, we, because we live in our bubble, are very difficult to discern what is true. It's very difficult. And one of the things is we need for basic general education. How can you decide what is the truth if you have no clue about the last 3,000 years of history, if you don't know the Greek literature, if you don't know the Latin Greek literature, if you don't know the philosophers, if you have no clue, how can you define what is truth? We as Christians, we would say, well, we have the Bible, we know everything. I'm a little bit concerned <laughs> if that is really true, that we know everything. We, we lose our kader, can you see that, our, 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 a bigger picture to see the things how they are, because we have the bigger picture not anymore, we just have what we want. And we teach children not to know things, but just where to find things. So we say, if you want to know who is Marco Polo, go on Google and they will tell you. That doesn't mean that you know it, that you understand it. We don't teach basic general education anymore, which is 
hugely dangerous for to make a whole society manipulable. Um, so this is a very funny situation. <laughs> the VUCA world is wild. Let me give you a little bit of comfort. <laughs> God is there. We had that already. <laughs> Second World War, 500 after Christ, uh, 1200 was a crazy time also. Um, so it's not new, but it is new for us because it's exploded in, a, in like 20 years time that we cannot handle it anymore. Now we have to learn to live with it and live in it with Christ and learning from each other. I personally have really no fear in this situation because I strongly believe in God and I'm an optimist. <laughs> Those two things help. <laughs> but also, I'm connected to very creative, bright people, and we learn together. Because if I'm alone, I get lonely in this system, and I, uh, I can get full of despair. That's why we need guilds, that we, why we need each other to learn. So, if we have this, um, the VUCA leadership, what do we need then? Um, kind of leadership, and I already had that on the other page. I just want to highlight it one more time. We need purpose driven leadership. We need from each one of you purpose driven leadership. That you are driven by purpose, that God gives you a define purpose for your life, for your calling, for your giftings, and that you are a purpose-driven leader who gives vision for what God has shown you. You don't have to understand the whole stuff, because you cannot. That's also relaxed. Huh? Um, but for what you know and who you are, you're called to give leadership. Secondly, we need <coughs> leaders who can handle empathy in all directions, who understand, who understand leaders, who understand colleagues, who understand people. We need to have empathy based in deeply respect to be able to understand people. Because we can lead people only if we are willing to understand them. Thirdly, we need courageous, Courageous and humble leaders who are willing to give clarity in a courageous way because you, you don't know any, everything, so you have to find out this is the place God has given me, this is my vision, my purpose, and I'm willing to give some clarity in that. But also humbleness that you don't think you know it all. And then the last one, um, innovation. Innova sorry, innovation and co-creation. To be, if we live in a world where we have no clue what is the truth anymore, we need to become innovative ourselves, design new things, new products, new ideas, and we will be able to do that when we co-create. One of the next things you will hear about is what we call duo leadership. Two people leading together. Because it's really dangerous if one person leads by himself. But not only duo leadership, we need duo leadership of a man and a woman. This will be the next step in leadership. We need leadership teams where men and women lead on the same level with the same kind of responsibility. Because when only men lead, it's dangerous. Because men are limited. I can tell that because I'm a man. <laughs> we are limited. We are happy, but limited. Yeah. And maybe we are happy because we're so limited. Uh, yeah, we have a focus, it's what we want, and we get it, we're happy. Um, but we are limited. So, women... Huh? Yeah, yeah, don't change it. Don't change it. <laughs> Stay like that. <laughs> so, but if you only have men in leadership, this is extremely dangerous in a VUCA world. Because you think you know everything, you think you know where we, we need to go, and you just go there, and you might go very fast in the wrong direction. 
So we need men and women, because women are more panoramic vision, they have more a broader insight, they are better wired, they are more intelligent, and they need to complement those men in leadership. The same, by the way, if you have only women in leadership, it's the same dangerous thing. So take that for an idea, the next thing will be leadership where men and women learn to live and to work together and think together and lead together. This will not be just easy. Latest report in Holland, which is a very feminine country, 70% of all young men under 30, so that's millennials under 30, 70% of all young men do not want to work under a women leader. I was shocked. These are the new generation, these are the bright guys. <laughs> but at the same time, 55% of all women under 30 do not want to work under a women leader. So, but this is understandable, because most women in leadership today had to fight for this, and unwillingly became more bitch as they want. So yes, unwillingly, but they had to fight in that position. So that is not a nice leadership. So the pictures people have is not positive. We need to change the picture, we need to change the system. And, but you will see this will be one of the very important things because we need to co-create leadership. And we need men and women doing it together. So if we take the VUCA world and the 100 year life together, then there is um, an implication to that. So, it used to be we live till about 85. So, for us, we die, but then we go into heaven, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. By the way, some people think in heaven you lay down in the grass and you sing 1,000 year hallelujah. <laughs> but it could be different. <laughs> uh, realistically, you will work there also. Huh? So anyway, uh, so you, you move to heaven after 85, more or less, average. Now, so you work about 40 years and you prepare for that, you learn to do that, you change your job several times, but then uh, when you're 65, more or less, or 67 today, uh, you have to stop. Now, in the next phase, which is for most of the young people here already the situation, but for a lot of people like me, it will be also, it's like we'll, people who die at 100 110, uh, 105, they will have to work till 85, so the span of work uh, will become about 60. And that is a big step. Uh, because if you plan to run for 40 years, then you, after 40 you die. If you plan to run 40 years, you have to go 20 more years, and you never learn to change your mind, you never learn to learn a new profession, then you really suck. So what happens here is, the next thing is that about every fifth, this is the VUCA world now, every 15 years you have to change profession. That means you have to be masters in transformating yourself, reinventing yourself, unlearn, relearn and learn a new profession. Not a job, a new profession. So the basic competences we will need are around this. In this world where we live in, a beautiful world with fantastic things happening, but also a longer world, possibly. So, the VUCA and the 100 year, most people make about five transitions in life. I made only one, from an architect to a consultant, that's just one. But, and I'm doing this job now for 31 years, woo! And I think, because my, my job is high on the list of, <laughs> of uh, jobs that will stay, <laughs> so if you're, like, if you're a psychologist, you're also okay. You know, you, we will need psychologists for the next 100 years, so that's okay. Um, but, so, I maybe don't have to transform anymore. But that's a rare situation. Most of us will need to have five transitions, Every transition takes three years. So you cannot say, 
I was an engineer, now I become a, a doctor, or now I become a consultant. People think that can, but it is not true. It takes three years to unlearn, to relearn, and to really develop. So it takes three years, and you have to calculate that. You have to uh, have money for that, you have to prepare that, you have to learn in those times, you have to really learn a new job. So you need to unlearn and relearn about five professions, and you need about five years to become a professional in their new profession. Remember we talked about, well, three years ago, the mastery. To become a, from a student a professional takes five years for your head-heart-hand coordination. So now if you start a new job, uh, some people will say, well, I was very good in this profession, now I become a coach. You know how many coaches we have in Holland? I think 35,000 or so. Um, and we have obviously 70 million on football. But, <laughs> but to become a coach, after you've done something completely different, that will take five years of hard working to learn the trade of a coach. Everybody, no, I know a coach, I, I'm a coach, I'm a coach already. I know how it works. I can talk to people. But that's a little bit simplistic perspective of a trade. So, most people will take five transitions in life. Every transition is about three years. They need to unlearn and relearn five professions, and they need five years after the transition to become a professional in their new profession. Then they will do that for 10 years as a professional, or maybe, maybe master in that time, and then they start over again. <coughs> so that means we need some new competences. Are you still okay for five minutes? And then we do a little uh, exercise. Um, the new competences need in the VUCA world, in this wild world, and if we live that 100-year life, or many will live that year life, are five elements. First is transformational competence. I need to learn to transform myself, to reinvent myself. That's a unique, clarified competence. You can learn that. Secondly, productivity competence. You need to learn how to produce also in that new profession. There's a fantastic book written on this deep work from uh, Cal Newport. Uh, he writes that about 60% of time we are involved with digital information that doesn't help us any further. So 40% we are working maybe on the right stuff. So how do we learn to do deep work we have shallow work, we also need that. But where do we do deep work? How do we do that today, in this world? And there's a nice book, Deep Work. It's very uh, applicable. The, uh, the first three chapters are good, the rest is repetition. So just read the first three chapters, buy the whole book. But um, This is all about how can we learn to be productive in this VUCA world. Vitality competence is all about resilience. Um, it is not good enough to just work till you die. It is important to live a healthy life in your brain, in your body, in your soul, in your spirit. Um, and this is a competence we need to develop new. Relational competence. We will look at all of them in a minute, but relational competence is needed for every other competence. You only can transform your life if you have good relationships. You only can be productive if you have the right relationship to co-create with. You only can stay vital if you have what we call regenerative friends who regenerate you. That is only when you are able to have relationships. And then the last one is financial competence. Uh, obviously, we need to rethink and become entrepreneurs. 50% of everybody anyway. Now, 80% in India has to do that. 70% in Africa has to do that. We only, in our place, we have about 10% has to do that. Uh, but we will need to learn it more. So these are what we would call the five competences. They come partly from the 100-year life. They, they figure them out. But you'll also see that in uh, Klaus Schwab's book on the competences. And actually, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, as a, as a philosopher, talks a lot about that too. Um, what I would like you to do, for, a, for just for a few minutes, if you can sit together with three people and take maybe two minutes in your brains, 
if you look at those competences, if you hear the story till today, which of these product competences you think personally you need the most? You need them all. <laughs> But you personally, today, which one of the five, even I just talked a little bit about it, but just from your impression, what do you think you need the most? Which one is the one you need to develop the most? So can you sit together in small groups of three, uh, just for a few minutes, and the oldest person of the three can start. <laughs> <laughs> Express what you think you need the most. Okay, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, there will be coffee soon, <laughs> and uh, then you can continue the ideas with some more background. What I would like to do for the, re the rest of the time, walk with you through all the five competences, give you some ideas, finish with next steps, what you can do, and then we have some time for questions. Okay, let's start with those five competences to get an idea. Transformational competence is about recreation. Recreating your purposeful life. You don't need to recreate your purpose, but you need to recreate your purposeful life. Your purpose is given, is deep in you, as God has given you that, but it has to recreate it in a way that you can apply it for today. We will talk about creative life planning 3.0. Uh, and we, I actually do that every five years. So every five years I have a rhythm. I've done that the first time in, when I was 30 years. We went for a sabbatical to Hawaii, which is a nice place to go for a sabbatical. Uh, we stayed there for half a year. I did a three-month three study and three months I worked as an architect and I did thinking and designing. Um, and then I started to reflect and then I started the company actually. My wife started the preschool, so it was a the big change. And then we found out this is good to do every five years. So the last 30 years, every five years, I take the time to do that. We have a small book on that in English and German and Dutch, Creative Life Planning 3.0. We had it already, but this is a new one since last year on in the VUCA world. It's more like a way how to think through five steps to organize where is my purpose, where is my perspective. Secondly, uh, to have transformational competence, you need to have diversity in networks. A lot of people, they work maybe for 25 years in, a, in an organization, in a profession, and their network is very limited. It's only the people they know from work, from friends, from sport, from church. It's a very small network. Now the work is not there anymore. They lose their network also, and they have nothing. We need to learn to have diverse networks, different networks as our normal ones. Um, and that is important to be able to do those transformations. Thirdly, creative and innovative innovation competence. Obviously, when the robots are developing stronger, uh, one of the few things that is left is empathy and create creativity. Uh, so we will need to really work on our creative competences and our innovative competences. And you as artists, you will need to do the same because it's a gift God has given you. Please keep on developing it because it's your gift to this world. So recreation is about deliberately thinking, stopping, reflecting, new organizing and saying, this is the next phase I want to go. It's about building diverse networks and learn to keep on growing in your creative innovation, innovative competence. To do this, you will need the R of relations. <laughs> you need people who reflect with you. You need diverse networks. You need to co-create. Relations will be very important. I personally also believe we have a great advantage that we are Christians. Because we start with the 
presumption that we are beautiful, that we are respectful, that we are worthy, that we are unique, that we are wanted. This is the super best proposition to make this work. We don't use it always, but we have it. The second one, productivity competence. This is all about mastery. Uh, we talked three years about that, three years ago. Mastery is the growing, the deliberate growing in your art, in your profession. And we would say in our value system, in our company, that everybody in our company, whoever he is, if he is working as staff or as consultant or coach, he should invest a minimum of five percentage in his personal development. And then you say, oh, there's nothing five percent. Well, 5% is four hours every week. Uh, that is about 200 hours a year. Uh, that is really time. And that for us is a minimum requirement to invest in your own mastery. Because if you do not invest in your mastery, you will go down. So my sport is uh, climbing, sport climbing. So I do co sport climbing. If I don't do it anymore, I will not be able to do it anymore. <laughs> Yesterday I was for my interval training. Uh, and then after three quarters of an hour, I'm totally sweaty. And, uh, and there was another lady who was uh, 40 years old. She was the world, uh, was Dutch champion, a European champion. She was there also. She goes there five times a week in the sports climbing thing, and does half an hour training. And she's still fit. So I do only three times a week, but I need to do that. If you don't train, you go down. By the way, for all of us who are over 50, you have to do two times as much fitness training as people under 50. So enjoy it if you're not 50. <laughs> if you're over 50, you have to really, really double it. So uh, you can do that by under 50, just do one hour a week. <laughs> so over 50, you only have to do two. But so mastery is about training. It's about taking time and energy. Entrepreneurship. Uh, to be able to be productive, we need to learn entrepreneurship. We need to consider our talents, the market, and money. Uh, many Christians don't like money. I also don't like money, but I don't dislike it. It's neutral. Money is the same as power. It's exactly the same. Because power is the freedom to choose. And money is also the freedom to choose. That's why Jesus says, if you cannot handle the little money, how can you handle the power of the kingdom of God? People who cannot handle money cannot handle leadership. Well, you can see it all over the world. But it's also a basic reality. If you cannot handle money, you cannot handle power, you cannot handle leadership. So we need to learn to handle that. And it starts with little kids. We had to train our little kids to handle money. Now they are 30, 28 and 26. Our oldest son and the youngest son both started a company. Two years ago they started the climbing gym. So they had to build that, invest money, get money, do that. And in two years' time, they became adults. <laughs> Before that, they were studying and having fun and surfing and climbing and traveling the world and, and really, really enjoying life. And the last two years, they also enjoy life, but they also became adults. And a lot has to do by also handling responsibility. So entrepreneurship, um, some people have it in their genes. That doesn't mean that they handle money well. I have seen entrepreneurial people who do not handle money well. So it is a gift, but it is also a talent you can train, and you will need Christ to help you in this. Tribes, that's what we talked last time about. Real mastery, you will need tribes of small groups of people to learn together. It's totally actually not realistic to learn just by yourself. Yeah. I love to go to lifelong expositions of artists. So there was one uh, two years ago at Rembrandt. They had pictures of Rembrandt's paintings, just pictures. But you could show, see this first painting till before he died. Or Van Gogh, I saw one. Fantastic. If you look at them, you will see they always had tribes. They always were connected to some other people where they were learning from. Uh, in the um, 
Hermitage in, um, in Amsterdam is at the moment uh, it's still there. The, the paintings from the Hermitage from Petersburg, maybe they are gone already. Uh, it was also really interesting, a whole picture on the wall, who was the master of who over 50 years. So you saw all these painters connected. We need tribes to get mastery. So again, we need Christ in this, but we need also relations. The third one, vitality competence, starts with resilience. Resilience are seven competences you can train. Um, little book on, on that, we also have that in Dutch and English and, and uh, German. Seven topics, how you can train yourself to, to go for the marathon. We have a scan on the table. You can scan your 70 questions. And if you do it, you can see where are your strengths and where are your weaknesses and resilience. Be aware. <laughs> if you don't like feedback, don't do it. No? Uh, <laughs> but if you like feedback and positive feedback, you can make yourself as good as you like. <laughs> But it is, the idea is to get a start, where am I today in my resilience, in my inner strength to recover after a blow. Resilience is I push, and the metal goes like this, if the push is gone, it comes back. And I push and it comes back. And the better it comes back, the higher the resilience is. People with high resilience, they will have a, when they have a trauma, they will have post-trauma growth. People with low resilience have post-trauma stress disorder. So the starting of the trauma, the life before, determines a lot how we handle the trauma. Well, obviously our life is not full of traumas, but full of disappointments and fear and anxiety and criticism. To handle that, we need that level of resilience. Vitality starts with building up resilience. It's about seven competences. One is a reconciled past. So Marc Chagall had a high level of resilience because he could always reconcile with his past again and again and again. And he was blown over, blown over, and de destroyed and tre treasoned, but he stood up again and again. Had a high level of resilience. Uh, the second one is optimistic realism. Third one, strategic competence. Fourth, working with your talents. Fifth, discipline. Just basic life discipline. The sixth one is passion. Well, we have that enough. And the seventh one is building good relationships, relational capable. So we need those competences and we need social resources. Here we are again, relations. And we need structural resources, systems around us that help us to get energy to keep on going. Why is this important? Because we are going for the marathon not for the sprint. Remember, if you want to be productive and creative till you're 95, then you need to build up a different lifestyle, maybe as today. Fitness and health, obviously, is logic. Um, you can destroy your life in a short time, or you can help it to recover. For instance, oxytocin. Have you ever heard of oxytocin? That's, it's a hormone that comes when a, a woman gives birth. They get a lot of oxytocin. But oxytocin also starts when you are thankful. When you are thankful and you speak out gratitude to a person or to God, then you get a push of oxytocin. Interesting, huh? And oxytocin is designed to repair your veins and your heart. So God designed our system that when we are living a life of gratitude, we are recovering all the time our veins and our heart. So there is beauty in God's design in us. And then we should also take care of it. So there was a guy who said, an artist, who said, why should I sleep? I can sleep when I'm in heaven. And he died when he was 37. No? Uh, so he could sleep a long time, but I'm not sure if this was the perspective. So fitness and health, and then regenerative friends. Uh, Linda Gratton in The 100 Year Life has a lot of studies how friends influence our lives. And you have what we would call regenerative friends. If you come together with them, you get energy from that. Social, structural energy, it builds up your energy and your resilience. So you also will have uh, manipulative friends 
who will suck away the energy out of you. Don't kill them, don't shoot them. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't kick them out because they are also people. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, and you can only handle a few of them. So you must be wise who are your friends and where you to put time with. So the fourth one is relational competence. Obviously, well, we saw the R all over the place. And by the way, again, Christ is really interested in your body and in your soul and in your mind. He says, my spirit lives in you. You are the house of my spirit. So relational competence, community, starts with self-trust and self-respect. It's very difficult to build up healthy relationships if you do not have self-trust and self-respect. Several times I met people, uh, Christian people would say, don't trust me, trust God. That sounds really good, right? Very spiritual. But then I would think, okay, okay, then I don't trust you, that's okay, I trust God. Then they say, no, 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 trust God in me. And then I get confused. I mean, who do I trust? God in him or him or who is now there? So I get really mixed up, and I'm not so good in multiple personalities. So um, <laughs> then I rather say, then, then rather not, right? If you say you cannot trust yourself, how can you expect that somebody else trust you? You cannot. Obviously, we are all sinners, right? We have the great opportunity and possibility to sin. And we do it, uh, because we are stupid. <laughs> But we can get forgiveness and God trusts us and he respects us and he wants to grow in a healthy way, us to grow in a healthy way. So we need to grow in self-trust and self-respect. Obviously you teach that little children, but not all of us had the opportunity to be taught in that. So our lifelong we will be in the process of relearning to self-trust and self-respect. That's part of the deal. If we have that, then we need to develop WeQ. It's also a little bit a new word, a lot of publications on WeQ, that is actually the intelligence to relate to others. Not only to think in I, 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 but in we, I, we, I. And WeQ is a talent, it is the, basically the ability to do dialogue. And then team ability, and uh, there is a whole studies on how you do good teams. Um, I put a little overview of the, the latest overview of what we would call Team 4.0, six elements, how you build a good team. In the future, you will be part of five to seven teams at the same time. In the future, we'll be part of five to seven teams at the same time. So you must be quick if you are in team A to be well there, then I go to team B, have to be well there, and where is your priority if you are in five teams? You have to learn to become teamable because we need co-creation, we need to build up, we need to stand together. So team ability, weak you, and self-trust are the three core elements of learning to live and build community. The fifth one, and then we are, have them all, financial competence. We call that liquidity. Some people dream about a lot of money and don't have it. Yesterday, again, with this young uh, man, he says, I want to be financial independent when I'm 50. Have you ever heard that? I have heard that many times, yeah, coaching many people. And then I, I know very few people who are really then <laughs> financial independent. The question is, why do you want to be financial independent? That's a very India and USA system. Because in Europe, we believe, one of our basic pillars of our belief is that work is a holy privilege to be a creator after the image of the great creator. In India or USA, they think work is a curse. And you have to stop as soon as possible with it <laughs> and have freedom. And in India especially, if people are on that place that they do not have to work anymore, then they are there. That's a very unchristian perspective. God created us to work till we die. And then in heaven we go on. Because it is a holy privilege. 
So we need to have in our mind, how do we see work? Is it a must or is it a privilege? And if it is a privilege, we have to design it and we have to handle also money with it. And we, we talk about earn, give and save. This comes from John Wesley. You heard about John Wesley, start of the Methodist. He trained millions of people in England who were very poor to handle money well. And he says, what you need to do is three things. Earn as much as possible and as is healthy. Save as much as possible and as is healthy. And give as much as possible and as is healthy. Very wise. So we take that. We want to learn to earn little things. Calculate 30, per, 30 plus. Most people calculate their products with all the costs and all the things and they say, well, this is it. Well, you never are able to calculate well. So on your best calculation, put 30% plus, then you probably make a little profit and all the unforeseen costs are in there too. Cross media, well, you heard about that already. We need to be available and findable by people to sell our art, our product, our service, or whatever. And focus, uh, we need to really focus on what is God's call on us to what people in what market. So that's a whole story how to earn. The other story, story is about how to save. Uh, I remember I, I started, uh, uh, became a Christian when I was 16 with the Jesus People Movement. That is really the last century. Yeah? So uh, I was 16 and we had long hair and no beard and later a long beard and long hair. And we were having uh, guitars and singing in Den Haag on the streets. Uh, it was really fun. And it was, God was all over the place and we were all over the place. And we didn't believe in money. <laughs> well, we earned money, we worked normally. Uh, everybody worked and took, took care of everything, but we never saved anything, we never organized it a lot. We just, we, we believed in revival. How, it was really good, yeah. It, it went on for three years, <laughs> and then the first difficulties came, and then they sent us out. <laughs> it was like that, if you have too many questions, you will send into the missions. And the first mission was Den Haag. The, the first mission was in, in Holland. You would go to Dordrecht or other places. If you have too many questions, they would send you to Belgium. That's, you know, that's like so far away, <laughs> you don't come back. If you have really a lot of questions, they sent you to Germany. That was like Siberia. Yeah. <laughs> so I was sent to Germany. <laughs> when I was 19, I was only one year there in the organization, really, and then they said, Paul, we really feel you are called to Germany. <laughs> and I knew why. <laughs> I'm, I'm a born Catholic, so we Catholics are really funny. We like to enjoy life, and we ask a lot of questions, and we don't obey. <laughs> so anyway, so I was sent away, <laughs> far away, uh, and started all over again. And then I had to learn to live a Christian life and also learn to handle money well, to earn and to save and to organize it. Build a buff buffer that is at least three months of your paycheck. Uh, passive income. And I think you already talked about um, copyrights. No, you didn't talk. Well, there's bad news. <laughs> I talked to a guy from uh, Ukraine, who is a Christian, fantastic guy, and he explained me why in East Europe you can forget all the copyrights. He says, we believe in it, but we copy everything. Well, there was a really a nice Christian guy, really spiritually fantastic. Uh, but he says, you know, there is no way, we just do it. All over the place. Everything. Whatever. Yeah. Be happy. I mean, it's, we believe in shareware. <laughs> so, there is some reality <laughs> in that. Obviously, we live in the bubble of Western Europe or Europe or, uh, that we think we can have it, uh, but there is a limited place for that. So we have to find out how can we produce, but also how can we have some passive income. Retirement, safe. Uh, you talked about that, right? Retirement a little bit. Um, well, if you anyway work till you're 95, you don't have to retire. But that's a little bit difficult, because if you cannot work anymore, you have to have something where you can still live. So retirement, passive income, a buffer, 
we need to learn also to save and we need to learn to give. I strongly believe in giving, generous giving. Uh, not just because when I give, God gives me back. Yeah? Have you ever heard those speeches? Yeah? You give the money, you're 10% and God will abundantly give you back. Have you heard that? And then they say, I challenge you to do it. And then people do it and they don't get it back. I think that is a form of criminality. But well, well, careful. <laughs> because generosity is right, right? It is from God. Give. But it is one side of the coin. You have a coin. One side is give. The other side is earn. If you do not train people to earn and save, you have not the right to train them to give. If you do not train the people to earn and to save, you're misleading them if you just tell them to give. It's two sides of the coin. It's too much black and white, just do this. Uh, and I see that in Africa, but also in Europe, all over the place. Um, let's find a basic, healthy way how we handle finances. Earn, save, and give. I try to give to give the best I can do. That's giving. Give your best work. Give the best you can do. Invest regular time in studying and training. You become a master, you stay a master. That's giving. I believe in a plus one service. Don't give the people what they need, but give extra. That's generous. And I believe in generosity, supporting people, giving people to the poor, helping other systems to develop. Uh, and it's not so that I get money, but I think it's a character of God if we can do that. So five elements, five competences we need in a VUCA, an exciting VUCA war zone. Um, and the 100 year life is transformational competence. We need to relearn ourselves and every five years or every seven years to reinvent ourselves. Productivity competence, build up our mastery. Vitality competence, train ourselves in resilience that we can do the marathon with pleasure. Relational competence, that we stay in the right connections. And financial competences, so we grow in a basic entrepreneurship. Finally. <laughs> Next steps. A few ideas, you don't have to do that, it's, it's, it's about you. Uh, but just some ideas before we stop. Recreate. Creative life planning 3.0. You can do that all by yourself. You don't need a coach, don't need support. You can do that yourself. Uh, refocus your mission. Refocus your mission. I do that every five years and every year I sit together for two days to consider what was last year, how do I refocus the next year. Build your masterpieces in the next five years. What are the masterpieces you are going to build in the next five years? in your work and in your family. Because in family and private, you have masterpieces too. Build resilience, scan your seven competences. If this is your topic, get the scan, scan your competences and build your realistic and good holistic training program. Get ready to be able to do the next step. Build your entrepreneurship. So, as we all know, as self-employed people, we need to build our own company. Define your mission, vision and strategy and define your customer service number one. If you are not willing to serve your customers really from your heart, you have not the right to earn their money. If you are not willing to serve your customers with your heart, you not, have not the right to earn their money. Um, we would say in our company, if you don't love your customers, you have no right to talk. And love is an unconditional yes. That is, who you are, whatever, I give you first an unconditional yes. Then I can talk. Your healthy finances, so build your entrepreneurship. The fourth one is, invite God. Not unimportant. Obviously, we are all Christians uh, in all kinds of different colors. And still, we forget sometimes in our daily life to invite him. 
we work and we do, and then we think, oh, let's pray. We try to do that on a daily basis. We actually have little apps where small groups are working together, so we app each other, uh, and if somebody goes to a difficult situation, he will tell him, here I am, please pray for me. So we are in a continuous app tribe of prayer, because we believe it's important. But also invite God to see beauty. Simone Weil, maybe one of you knows that, it was a lady around the World War II. She says, beauty is the smile of Jesus visible in this world. Beauty is the smile of Jesus visible in this world. Please create beauty. But also see beauty. Take the time. I take the time to see beauty. It's all over the place. Build your tribe. I am very convinced of this. Um, not everybody has that. Uh, so I, as I started our company, I said, I don't want to do it alone. We want to do it with three of us. So I am a tribe guy. But some people are not. I know many artists who don't like people. <laughs> they, they basically like people because they are people. <laughs> but they don't want to work with them. Yeah. Um, but still, you will need other people to reflect with. You will need some people you can handle and you like and you learn together. There's this new book on inklings. I told last three years ago about that. C.S. Lewis, uh, Tolkien and all the others, how they work together. There's a little book on it now, how that developed. It's fantastic to say, to see how they over 15 years learned together and took really a lot of time to work together and to think together. So next steps. Recreate, build resilience, build your entrepreneurship, choose one, but please invite God to see beauty and build your tribe. Questions? <laughs> Coffee, <laughs> yes. Yeah. The earning thing. Earning thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's all right. Um, two things you didn't really define. What, first of all, what is the three-month income buffer? What is that? How accessible is it? What, what are you talking about? Yeah. Um, we have a lot to do in our company also with startup teams in our own company. We startup team in South Africa and other places. So we, we train our people to build up what you need for the income of three months say uh, for a month, whatever, let's say you have 3,000 euros for a month, then you have to have an extra of 9,000 euro on your bank account, three months worth on your bank account you don't touch. Uh, to when you, have a de when you have a deep situation, no job, no work, everything gets wrong, you get sick, you have at least that three month level buffer. Can you say that, buffer? Yeah. And some people you say you need a whole year or six months, but I don't think that's realistic for startup. But you, we would say a three-month buffer is a good thing to have. Yeah. So if you're poor, you have to start to save towards that. I did that. I was an illustrator in America for 10 years. Yeah. And I learned that every January, every January, all the publishers stop for a month. Yeah. And, and I had to learn to save, at yeah. first, a month savings through the yeah. year. Because yeah. I didn't live on what I made per month, I lived on what I made per year. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to save a buffer for that. Yeah. And that's very typical, yeah. because you live in seasons. Especially as our, we also, we live in seasons. There are seasons where it's low, with seasons where it's high. And so you have to have that buffer, which is just, it doesn't have to be a lot. But if you are always have no buffer, you are forced to worry yourself every day. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It can take two years to save that money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and I need to add to that. Don't forget all your insurances and everything in this. So make a good budget of your one month to calculate the three months or half a year or whatever you want to have on your bank account to feel yeah. fine and feel free. Yeah, absolutely. I believe in insurance. 
I don't believe in too many insurance. <laughs> but I live in the basic things. And I want to take care of my family. I want to take care of my family when I cannot work. Uh, so I'm also, I'm not a rich guy, I, because I do a lot of funny stuff. <laughs> uh, but I want to take care of my family. That's basically, yeah. yeah. Uh, you're talking about the need for passive income. What is that? And yeah. um, what are we supposed to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, passive income obviously is if you have income where you do not have to be there. So uh, many people today buy houses, renovate them and get rent from it. That's passive income. Uh, so they organize a place where a system is working for them. That can be also, obviously, your auto rights. How do you say that? Auto rights? Copyrights. copyrights. But uh, don't expect too much from that, but organize it well. Um, and it can be that you produce, uh, if you would always sing and now you produce a music reproducible, that is also passive income. But I, I just want to uh, motivate you to think also in passive income. And many people, definitely uh, artists and startups, they live from day to day by everything they do. They want to get jobs. Very interestingly, I spoke to a very young lady, 20, very young, sorry, a young lady, 28 years old, and she works for a big company in Holland, uh, a big consultancy company, and they would say, you have a, uh, a work, you have a job, or you have a calling. They would call it a roeping in Dutch, a calling, a vocation. So these are not Christians, but they think in that terms. Uh, they believe in calling, and that's a just big business. Work, job, or calling. Um, so I, th I, I really believe we should learn to make our life as a calling, but then also organize it financially well. Yeah. One little question. Um, comment on the copyright stuff. It all depends. Let's say I personally I don't believe in, let's say, the, the free source uh, ideas because you all want to get your money back uh, in what you invested to create. Mm -hmm. So I know the example of uh, Ralph van Manen, the Dutch people here may know him, is very well known uh, singer songwriter. And um, he wrote with two other guys uh, a special song. And, huh? yeah, uh, Testify to Love. And that song went to America. And then a very famous Christian group um, saw, wow, this is a good song. They put it up. And finally, when uh, Ralf Manen got his share of the copyrights, who could, he could pay off the markets on his house. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this may be a little bit exceptional. Plus I know that uh, Ellie and Richard Zuiderveld, uh, all the people, Dutch people will know this, this couple, uh, a major source of their income to keep going and living are the copyrights. So be careful about your copyrights. Don't give it away too mm -hmm. easily. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, it's 11 o'clock. Yes. I think you have the rights for coffee and fun. Paul, um, give I will, the man I will a big be hand. here if you have questions. Thank you. Paul, we oh. thank you. A little present <laughs> to remember us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And uh, Shorts is there if you want to ask how to start a business uh, and how to start a tribe, ask Shorts. Yeah. <laughs> so Paul brought some books, so <laughs> buy it and you will be very blessed. And. Uh, <laughs> I was blessed by his book, so I, uh, I, I re really can say that. So be back in 20 minutes. Mm.